some people can't be here with us. And I said I would make it available afterwards. So uh, my idea was that there is a six week Catherine of Siena College course, which I designed in 2018 mm -hmm. as part of a continuing professional development course. But it's very much based on resources that I've gathered over the years through my interactions with a wide range of Catholic women around the world. Um, and I thought it would be good to share this during Lent because we are many of us in different ways participating in preparations for the Synod and for feeding back for that. Uh, we've probably all got rather mixed experiences depending on what channels of participation we have available to us, whether it's parishes or dioceses or groups or networks. But I thought that during Lent we could perhaps use the course that I have to reflect together on what it means to be a Catholic woman today from a very wide variety of backgrounds and positions along the huge spectrum of Catholic faith and practice from those who feel very marginal or have left to those who feel very committed and still fully participating. Um, so the whole course is going to be available online free and I'll show you all the different links in a minute in the form of the video lectures I recorded for the course in 2018. But there are lots of other resources, including PDFs of books and articles and links that are referred to during the lectures that are available to those who sign up for the full course on the learning platform. Now, we don't want to exclude anybody on the basis of cost. So we do have bursaries of half price and full price. We have a very generous offer of someone who's offered to pay uh, double so that someone else can can join in. We, we have to cover our costs, but we also do have a small fund for bursaries. So if you if you want a reduction in fees, it's absolutely fine to ask. You just need to email Anna can tell me whose email address is on all the information to get a code to enter for a bursary. So I'll show you where the links and everything are, but maybe we could, I'm just checking there's nobody in the waiting room. <laughs> um, ah, where's it gone? No, I don't think so. Okay. Uh, so maybe people would just like to introduce themselves before we start. Um, my name's Tina Beattie. I'm the director of Catherine of Siena College, which is the platform for the course we're using for this. Uh, I started the Catholic Women Speak Network in 2014, which some of you will be familiar with. And I'm a former professor of Catholic studies at the University of Roehampton in London, where Ginny Jordan Arthur is the chaplain. <laughs> so um, we'll get to know each be other better as time goes on, but would you like to introduce yourselves and unmute yourselves for this? Who's going to go? Mary Monaco, you're first on my screen here. Okay, um, can you hear me first of yes, all? Yes, yes. Okay, uh, I live in Washington State in the United States. I'm retired. And I have two volunteer ministries in which I participate. One is uh, uh, acting as a guardian at Lightham for children in the CPS system, which is our child protective system, children who have been removed from their homes. And the other is as a hospice volunteer with one of our major uh, health organizations here as a vigiler. I, I sit with those people who are, are dying, who have no one to be with them as they transition from this life to the next. Gosh, what an amazing role. <laughs> thank you, well, welcome. Lovely to meet you, Mary. Well, thank you, thank you for having this. I really appreciate this opportunity, so. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ginny. <laughs> Hi, um, so yes, Tina said, I'm Ginny John Arthur and I'm uh, the Catholic chaplain at the University of Roehampton. Um, I also worship in our local parish church, which is St. Joseph's. Um, 
been part of Catholic uh, Women Speak. I also um, have two small-ish children running around the place. So um, I'm trying at the beginning of Lent, this is my commitment, because I'm terrible in the last couple of years of carving out real time. And I thought, actually, if I commit to being to other people, <laughs> I might actually do a proper retreat. So um, but if my camera suddenly goes off, it's just because someone's come frailing in the corner of me. But that's who I am. Okay. Yeah, if, you, if you don't know Roehampton, I guess I say I, I'm in London. Sorry. Yes, I'm in a small town on the south coast of England. I've just been for a walk along the dunes and the glorious coast. So, But lovely to see you again, Jenny. Mary Kennan. <laughs> Hello, I'm Mary. I'm from Liverpool. I'm a mostly retired teacher. Um, I've been part of Catholic Women Speak for, well, almost from the beginning. Um, and it's going to find it really useful looking at things with the synod in mind. Uh, we've had very little about it in Liverpool. Um, I'm part of a little group that grew out of uh, an English actor conference and we decided that we wanted to keep in touch. So we meet fortnightly and we are looking at the synod and thinking how we're going to feed back. Thank you, and lovely to see you. <laughs> Another founding member of Catholic Women Speak, I think. <laughs> Fides, nice to meet you. Hello, Tina and everyone. Uh, good, good afternoon to you. I'm Fides del Castillo. I get to know the, um, the course through Dr. Anna and Dr. Agnes Brazal. She is my colleague in De La Salle University, Manila. So I'm originally from the Philippines but I'm on my sabbatical leave. That's why I'm staying here in New York. Uh, I also, um, I have a, a fellowship in the Fuller Theological Seminary. So I have been staying here for quite some time to do some research on Christianity and mission. So I'm really happy to be here and um, thank you so much for having me here. Thank you and lovely to meet you. Welcome, it's great to have you with us. And Mary McCartney, we have you got? Ah, oh, there we are. We can see you now, Mary. <laughs> Welcome. Um, sorry, I, I just can't turn it round so that I can look straight at you. Forgive me. I'll try and sort that's that all out. right. This is this is lovely to have such a an international group of people. It's that that is really nice. Um, I have I can't say so specifically as, as all of you of what I'm doing and where I am. I'm actually pretty homeless in terms of. Uh, the church. I'm not actually a lapsed Catholic. Um, I'm a not really very, at the moment, participating Catholic. Um, as one sister once said to me many, many years ago, when I would, went for an interview for a job somewhere, she, and I said, I have to tell you, this is a Catholic establishment, sister, but I'm a lapsed Catholic. And she said, oh, no, 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 Mary, there's no such thing as a lapsed Catholic. Sure, you're only taking time out, which, which was, was, was so comforting. Um, <laughs> I didn't get the job, but that's another story. No. <laughs> I actually only found out about this this morning, um, quite by chance. I don't know if Tina saw my email. I, I don't go on Facebook very often, but this morning I did go and I had a bit of a scroll. And as I was scrolling down, there was your, Tina, there was your advertisement for this course this evening. So um, I thought, oh, I, I really must have a, have a look at that. And the other thing is, I was for many, many years a member of the JPIC, Archdiocese of Southwark. Um, um, and I still have my connections with them. And just recently, they invited me back in to be part of the group that did was it some kind of, we had to fill up something for the synod just recently, let the feedback. And one of the issues that I kept plugging and two or three other members said, we really want to tell them, we want them to look at women in the church very strongly. Because one of the reasons why I'm not participating as fully as I used to is I have gone through quite a crisis in the last years about why am I a Catholic woman in the Catholic Church? I wouldn't work for an organisation that treats me like the Catholic Church does. And the attitude it has to women in certain... I'm not a radical feminist, don't get the wrong idea, I'm just me. Um, 
And I don't want to let go. I want to still stay, but I really do need to see something change so I can feel that I really do belong. Thank you. Well, I think you echo what many, many people feel. And I think particularly the Synod coming after the pandemic, when those who were regular mass attenders have often found within themselves resources they didn't know they had to sustain their faith in different ways through a time of liturgical famine almost. And many are not willing to go back and submit to the old system. Um, of course, others have gone back very enthusiastically. One of the aims of Catholic Women Speak when I started it was to provide a forum where we go, we went beyond the polarization of Catholics between conservatives and liberals, whatever they want to call themselves, these labels are not very helpful, but that so long as we were courteous and respectful and open to dialogue, we would not exclude anyone. So the reality is probably that we do have quite a lot of women who are struggling and asking questions. But by no means do we seek to include, exclude those who are not. So we're a broad church in Catholic Women Speak, and I'll introduce you to some of the resources tonight. We do have a very wide range of wonderful resources from women of all ages, cultures, races, contexts from all around the world. One of the books we produced in 2018, the youngest contributor was 14 and the oldest was 84. And that book has, I think it has 28 contributors. So um, as we go through the course, I will be bringing in a lot of women's voices from around the world with huge diversity. Uh, we, we address issues of gender, of gender identity, of motherhood, of social justice, of ordination. Nothing is off the table, but everything is open to the different perspectives that people bring to these discussions. Um, so unless anyone has any questions, it may be helpful now if I just talk you through the various ways in which you can access what we're doing through Lent and show you some of our resources. So are you okay with that? Mm -hmm. So um, I'm going to start by getting up Catholic Women Speak website and then I'm going to share my screen with you. Please just unmute yourself and tell me if there are any problems. Just let me make sure there's nobody else in the um, waiting room. No, there's not. Okay, so I'm going to share our Catholic Women Speak website now. So if you go to, well, if you just Google in Catholic Women Speak, this is the website you'll come to. And what I'm putting on here for the next six weeks is completely freely available to anybody and everybody. There's no login, there's no registration. So for people who don't have time to follow the full course, they can still work through the videos and reflect on the questions as we go through it. So this is our home page. And if you just scroll down slightly, uh, you'll see, I might come back and show you this little video, which is a history of all that we've done since we started in 2014. But first I'll work through the introduction. So you'll see at the top of that home page, as you scroll down, there's a link right at the top please visit this page. And there you'll find an introduction to this course. Um, as I said, just bear in mind that there is a registration for all the resources with a fee if you can afford it, but that is absolutely not compulsory. If you want a reduction in fee, just email Anna, no questions asked, you'll get a code to get that. But as I say, we do, we do have to cover our costs. I, I volunteer with all this, but we do have admin staff and costs that we need to cover. So on that, you'll find the link to register for the course. You'll find if you scroll down, there are resources for the Synod in general, which don't particularly relate to this course, but we want to offer a resource to women who want to reflect. But from here, you can go to the actual course link 
and there you'll find a summary of each week's topic. So tonight the topic is narrative identities, women as storytellers. And you can go to the link here to find week one. And each week I will put up something like this, which you can just go to the link and see. So that's a brief summary of what the topic is about each week. This is the video lecture. This one is about 38 minutes, I think, that's part of the Catherine of Siena College course. Now you will find that the lectures refer to sources and coursework and essential readings and things like that. Just ignore those references. That's just because it's referring to a more formal course. But you may also find some of the course a little heavy going academically. It's not, uh, I, it's not sort of, it's probably let, targeted about a first year university degree level. So um, don't worry if you struggle with some aspects of it. And if you want to watch that lecture, it's there. Obviously, I'm not going to play it tonight, but I will just discuss some of the themes and perspectives that are introduced in this first week's lecture. Um, and then at the end of the lecture, you'll find references to three videos. Now these, we have 14 videos from women around the world, which were made when in 2018, we arranged a book launch and a symposium at the Pontifical University Antonianum on the 1st of October, Feast of St. Teresa of Avila, oh, I'm sorry, St. Teresa of Lisieux. And this was the second such event we had. The first one was in 2015. And these were both to mark collections of essays by women that we published on the Synod themes. And we launched them in Rome a week before the Synods started. And the second one in particular, we were very generously supported by relatively small donations from a lot of religious orders and individuals. So we were actually able to bring 26 women to Rome and about 40 other came under their own expenses. So we had an amazing gathering of women from around the world. And the bursaries we raised meant we could bring a lot of women who couldn't otherwise have come. So uh, there's an interview with Gertrude Yusufu from Sierra Leone, for instance, someone who really could never have come to Rome under her own steam. Zizana Radzik from Poland, Leslie Colvin from Alabama, USA. And as we go through the course, there are many more of these videos, which I recorded with a team from Roehampton University while we were there. So each week you will find something like this, which is not the full course, but it gives you enough if you want to just use it as a Lenten reflection and as a way to feel your way into it. Remember, just stop me at any time if you have a question. Now, if you register for the full course, um, can you see that? You will find this is the Moodle site. Moodle is an online learning platform which is managed by the University of Roehampton and we have access to it. And you'll see there that um, you get access to the full site. Each week, the lecture is made available on a Monday. Information about the course, a forum to introduce yourself. So if you're registered for this, you're part of an ongoing discussion through Lent. Um, a suggestion that you might like to keep a journal as you go through the resources, a schedule of topics, which is on the public website as well. Uh, and then you've got PDFs to both the books that have been published by Catholic Women Speak. And just to give you an idea of the resources, I'll download these and just show you the contributors pages. So the first one we published, can you all see this? Can you see that? No. Catholic Women Speak PDF? No. Ah, oh, maybe. Hold on. Maybe I need to just go in and share that. Um, OK. Can you see that? Yes. OK. Um, so if we go down and just look at the country, you can see how many contributors there are, all right? Um, 
and here are their biographies. I'll just quickly skim through. So you can see Anne from Nigeria, Olive from Ireland, me, um, England, England, uh, Agnes Brazal, if he does, <laughs> uh, Lisa Sol Cahill. What we have here, um, Rachel Espinosa, Margaret Farley, Astrid Gajiwala, Christina Gomez. We have women from around the world who represent both some of the best known women theologians and biblical scholars in the Catholic Church and women who, for example, use a nom de plume who have never told their stories before. Uh, so Amelia Beck is someone I know very well. She tells of her very traumatic attempt to follow the teachings of the Church on Contraception in early marriage, which resulted in five unplanned pregnancy children in six years, followed not, not surprisingly by a pretty massive nervous breakdown. So we have people who did not want to tell their names, but whose stories are very powerful. There's another story in this, in this book of um, a gay couple who, agreed to tell their story to lesbian women who are in a, I think they're married now, um, and who, who had twins by IVF and sadly the twins died. They were born prematurely and they died. And these two women tell their stories. So we have those stories that are kind of are very much on the margins of what the church deems acceptable, as well as people writing from the center, religious sisters, people employed in Catholic institutions, etc. So that just gives you a flavor of um, some of what you'll see. Okay, now I'm going to stop sharing and just share that other screen again. So I think you didn't see this when I put it up the first time. Did you not see this the first time? because I wasn't sharing it. This is the yes. Roehampton Moodle site. You can see it now though. So you, this is what you get if you sign up for the whole course. So you get these, these two books to download as PDFs. Uh, you get links to a number of websites that you may or may not know already, but that will help you to expand your understanding if you want to. Then for each week, you get what I've put on the public site, but you also get um, additional sources. So a whole load of recommended readings and resources if you want to follow up on anything. So you just get more than you would get if you just follow it on the website. Is that clear? I'm sounding a bit garbled to me, but I'm just trying to tell you the difference between dipping in and out on the website for Catholic Women Speak, which is fine to do. And of course, you can always go on to the Facebook page and start a discussion anyway, if you want to. And um, signing up for it, which will give you access to more resources. Any questions? And welcome to Ursula, who I think has just joined us. Have you joined us, Ursula? <laughs> ah, yes. Good. Um, Okay, any questions at this stage before I just introduce today's topic as a way to start us sharing? I have a question. Sure. Uh, I found this uh, presentation that we're in now. Uh, I was I, I don't go into Facebook very often either, and this popped up over the weekend and I was interested. Is Catholic Women Speak a membership organization? It's not, it's a very horizontal organization, uh, okay. but it's, it's membership really is by way of joining our private Facebook group. We have a private forum on Facebook, which after some initial problems, when we started way back with trolls and breaches of confidentiality, we've made very secure and please God, we haven't had any breaches of security, but that's, that is a Facebook forum where people who join can share in confidence. We have many members who don't ever post anything, but I realize when I see the numbers that they are often checking and watching, and that's absolutely fine to do. We have others who are very active. But if you don't do Facebook much, that is our main forum. But we also 
have the website and we put I'll go back to the website now actually um I think I do have to stop sharing every time I want to change what I'm showing you so um oh and now oh yeah sorry hold on can you just tell me if you see when I sh when I change this um hold on can does your screen change mine is I see a meeting schedule right now right that's good so if I go into this you can now see the main website for Catholic Women Speak Yes, I don't need to go. Time. Good. Okay. So I can share my screen without switching it on and off all the time. So everything that is of importance for women who are associated with Catholic Women Speak is on the website. So you don't have to be doing Facebook. But if you want to be part of our in-house conversations, if you like, <laughs> you should join the Facebook group. Thank you. That help. Yes, very much. Thank you. And something else before I forget, with regard to people wanting to feed back to the Synod, on International Women's Day, which is next Tuesday, we are Catholic Women Speak in collaboration with the Catholic Women's Council, which is an international network of uh, groups campaigning for women in the church, is launching an online questionnaire which I have worked on in collaboration with the University of Newcastle in Australia. And it's in six languages. And our modest aim is to gather 10,000 responses. It's a questionnaire which is as inclusive as possible in terms of where women are in the church. So most of it is just um, one to five options agree disagree don't know strongly agree etc but all the questions have the option to position yourself on that long spectrum with that it's not orientated towards conservatives liberals or anybody else it is an, a questionnaire that we've tried to make as representative as possible so next tuesday we will be launching that with links all over the place and trying to ensure that it gets out there so watch out for that as well those of you who are really wanting a forum because what we will do with that is we will um, analyze it and submit our findings to the Vatican for the August deadline but we will also make our findings public part of our aim with all that we're doing for the synod is to ensure that we're transparent and public in all the feedback which is why we're recording this as well to say look you know these are the things women are talking about these are the things we're saying and to keep quite a close eye on what is actually discussed when the bishops meet, to make sure that given that they've said this is a listening exercise, a dialogue, a process that we're all invited to be part of, uh, I think it's important to make sure that we tell the world what we've been saying. <laughs> I have to say that you will find on our homepage, a link to the Synod documents, which are magnificent. I have to say, if the Vatican continues as it started, then this is a really exciting thing. So you'll find links to access all the documents they've um, put out there on this home page. If you just scroll down, sorry, scroll down to where have I put it? <laughs> Sorry, I'm just. Uh... Have I gone to the. Yeah. I'll need to check that. The Synod link is on here somewhere, but I've, I've lost it when I've been preparing for this Lent course. But um, they also have a resource page where they're putting links to the things people are doing all around the world. And it's encouraging to see that they don't seem to be censoring that. There is a link up there to the Women's Ordination Conference on an official Vatican website. 
There is a link to an LGBTQ campaign that's encouraging LGBTQ people to participate in the Synod. And that was censored, it was removed. And then it was restored with an apology. So the Vatican is behaving in unprecedented ways so far. And I think that's another reason why we should speak out because if we don't speak out, we can't complain about not being heard. Mm -hmm. Okay, any, any comments? And I just want to welcome Ursula, who's joined us, another founding member of Catholic Women Speak. Ursula, do you just want to say a, a couple of words? A couple oh, of Tina, thank you so much. I'm just so grateful that you, as usual, you know, what would we do without you? But thank you for doing this course. It just helps me uh, focus and uh, I'll be feeding back into We Are Church in Ireland. And um, I, I'm just so grateful and thank you. I didn't realise that that page was there and, um, you know, we can all share that. Yes. So, yeah. Um, yeah. And I agree with you. It's, you know, we... We really, it is beholden on us now to contribute because I've never seen such change happen so quickly. And there's a sense too that the institutional church in many ways is is, is really falling apart. From, uh, there's so much going on between Europe and Ukraine and the, 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 the Catholic church as well at the same time. We are living in exciting times and we, yes, we really have to contribute to this synodal process yeah. and uh, I'm prepared to do that and, um, and, and thank you for, for doing this for us, Tina. Thank you. Well, my privilege and pleasure really, because it, it is nice to, to be able to do something. And I think given what's happening in our world right now, feelings of helplessness are pretty overwhelming. and. You know, I think it's important for us all just to say, well, I love Mother Teresa. What we do is a drop in the ocean, but the ocean would be one drop less if we didn't do it. And I think it's really important for us to do what we can and trust God to take that and <laughs> make mighty trees out of mustard seeds. <laughs> so, so if it's all right with you, I'll move on now to talk a little bit about what we cover this week, because I think it's quite important as we enter into the process of reflecting on who am I in this church? What is my identity as a Catholic woman, whether I'm practicing, not practicing, uncertain, moving in and out? Um, who am I in all this? And I'll go to week one and I'll download. You will find on every lecture um, a PDF of the whole lecture, which I'm going to download that now rather than watching the lecture so that I can just talk you through some of the slides and we can have a discussion around that. So again, I want to share, I don't think you can see that PDF now, can you? No. No, okay, so let me come out, share screen, and I want to share that. Okay. Can you see that? Yes. Good. So this is just the notes that accompany the lecture for this week. And you can read through those. I won't go through all of them, but um, yeah, this is an introduction to the books we've published, what you'll find on the website. There's a lot of information on the website that you can find. Um, and then we get to part two, which is where the substance of this lecture starts. And the idea of this second part is I start with a quotation from Pope John Paul II, which he sent to the Fourth World Conference on Women in Beijing in 1995, or he, he published it to coincide with that. And in a way, he was trying to redeem a rather disastrous situation because at the UN Conference on Population and Development in Cairo in 1994, even the most devout Catholic representatives say the church had egg on its face. It was obstructive. It was a naysayer. It was obsessively preoccupied with keeping control on any language that referred to 
birth control or abortion or anything like that, as a result of which it was just a totally obstructive presence and created huge ill will. So there was a real sense in 1995 of realizing they had to adopt a much more ironic approach. And the people who represented the church there were women with quite a good track record. And Pope Francis issued this letter in which he made a remarkable acknowledgement of the extent to which women's contributions and achievements have meant as much in history as men's, but they haven't been recorded. And he says, um, he refers to masculine projections that cast the female in a shadowy realm of subordinate otherness, closed off from much access to much that's essential for human freedom and flourishing. And one of the concerns as we begin to reflect on feeding back and participating is that because of this long history, the language we have to talk about ourselves as women is not in a sense our mother tongue, we belong to cultures which tell us who we are, which give us the values and language which define us. And from birth, we are taught that this is the this is the category you belong in and this is how you behave. And of course, after 50 years of feminism, we're aware that some of that doesn't fit and some of it doesn't work. But the quest for a language of women's self-expression goes on. I hope this doesn't make you dizzy when I'm just scrolling through it, but I don't want to spend too long. Now, this part of the sort of pioneering effort of feminist theology came in the early 1980s. There are two dates here because I refer to a second edition of Rosemary Radford through this book. But in the early 1980s, a number of women theologians, most of them Catholics, most of them from the US, began to argue that we had to bring out women's experience as a corrective to the theological tradition, that what presents itself as normative theology for the human is actually all theology written by and developed by men who are not aware of the particularity of their perspective. So how do we bring women's voices into this and begin to shape it in a way that sexual difference can be acknowledged, that different experiences can shape it. So we begin with the appeal to women's experience. But gradually, as time went on, people began to say, well, hold on a minute. Who says which experience counts? Who says which women are experiencing rightly and which experiences are wrong? So, you know, I might say, well, I would experience following church teaching on contraception as deeply oppressive in my marriage. You might say, well, actually, you know, it's worked extremely well for us. I might say I feel um, wonderful when I go to mass and see the celibate male priesthood. You might say, I just can't go there because of that male priesthood, whose experience counts. And also there was the sort of realization that a lot of this experience that was being given authority was the experience of white middle-class educated women. And so a proliferation began around different voices, contextual theologies coming in saying, well, what about colour, race, class, ability, disability, sexual orientation, everything that comes into the mix of who we are, sometimes called intersectionality. And that's sometimes known as the linguistic turn, the recognition that, yes, we have experiences, but the instant an experience is finished, I am interpreting it. What just happened? I need language. If I'm going to come to you and say, guess what just happened? I'm going to have to find a language we can both understand. And immediately my experience is interpreted. So the language we have available to us shapes how we relate our experiences. And in the ways we talk about ourselves, we are always filtering, selecting, stringing together meaningful 
stories around random events. If I look at my day to day just as a snapshot in time, it's probably just a jumble of things that don't add up. And what we do unconsciously much of the time is to make sense of that. We put a narrative onto it so that we say, well, you know, this is what I did today. This is why this is what then happened. Sometimes we have to accommodate world shattering events. At, at the time of the Ukraine, the narratives of people living there a month ago were not the stories they're telling about themselves today. They have no stories today. There are no stories for them today. There will be in time a process, but we go through that. Does that make sense to you? We are, we are creatures of language and who we are is woven together out of language. And so our attentiveness to the language we use when we describe our experiences, our relationships, our identities, um, is very important attentiveness to how we speak. So the first um, session in this course is asking us to reflect on that. Who I'm just going to go to the end. Um, who tells my story? Who is the author of my life? And I refer to a French philosopher who talks about the processes in reinterpretation. So if I am born a Catholic woman, I mean, I wasn't, I'm a convert, but if I were born a Catholic woman, I would have been given a Catholic narrative from the beginning. This is who you are. This is what you do as that person. And we all know that we're living in a time of questioning that, particularly around issues of gender and identity and the role of women. And so as I go through, I begin by conforming to what I've been told, this is who you are. And that is configuring my life. I'm using the tradition and the language it gives me to speak as a Catholic, as a woman, as whoever I happen to be. And then I begin to think that some of this doesn't fit. Some of it doesn't make sense to me. And I begin to struggle within the narrative that I'm given so that the story of my life and the story of the Catholic Church are locked into a kind of wrestling match as I try to find in that something that allows me to be more truthful and authentic. And this is never a one way process. Um, we've just got someone else entered. Um, it's always a question of I say this is how I'm experiencing this. And then I go back to the tradition or the language I have, and it will tell me something new about my experience. And so for this synod feedback, that's what we're doing, really. We're saying, well, in what ways do I want the Catholic faith to continue to be what it has been for me and what, na what nourishes me within it? What do I love? Is that something other people love too, so that we can come to a common agreement that this we share and this matters to us? What do I find inhibiting, oppressive, difficult? What do I find hard to understand? So the synod feedback, we can, of course, only feedback in questionnaires and short responses. But I think if it's to go anywhere, uh, I see Pope Francis said today, every change has to begin in our hearts. And we can say all we like as women in the church about what we long for. Mm -hmm. But there has to be something within us, particularly in these darkening times, that we can do this in a journey and go on from there with real resilience and hope and energy for the tasks ahead. And I, I always welcome Thoko. Am I pronouncing that correctly? Thoko, Thoko? Ah, can Thoko hear us? Are you muted, Thoko? Anyway. Hi, can you hear us? Anyway. I just want to allow a little bit of time for discussion, so I won't spend too much longer on this. But I, when I use the word hope, 
hope. I think it's really important to say hope is not optimism. These are not optimistic times. Sometimes it's good to be optimistic. If I, if I get a cancer diagnosis, I can optimistically hope that it's not going to, you know, be terminal very soon. And my optimism might well be justified. You know, that's, that's healthy optimism. But what happens when I discover actually, sorry, there's not much we can do. That's when hope has a role to play because optimism is always about hopefully tomorrow will be better. And therefore it saps us of today, actually. It takes away from us the fullness of the moment because this is just too awful. So I'm going to think about tomorrow instead. Now, we need to do that sometimes for our mental health. But if we live like that, we miss most of our lives. So my feeling is for this synod process, we need to hope. And hope is about being in the time I'm in and finding that, that horizon of promise that allows us to move through the reality of now into the promise of the future, even if it's an eschatological promise, which sometimes that's all we have. That's what that's all some people in Ukraine have right now, but they're fighting in the streets because they also have that deep hope that I stand for something today that I will not relinquish, even if I die standing for it. And somewhere in us, I think that's the kind of, that's what hope is. Does that make sense? Oh, that's brilliant, Tina. I, I, I did my dissertation on hope. I just wished I had listened to you before I wrote it. That's so well put. You encapsulated so beautifully. Um, thank you. Well, it's I've read. I mean, there are there are a lot of us thinking around this at the moment, and you know, you will know that from your dissertation, Ursula. That, but I think it's so important. You know, the time I think has gone for rebellion. I yes. think it's for resilience and hope now is, you know, are the, the dynamics we need to change. <laughs> yes. Tina, I was just saying that to someone. I, I had a sense that, you know, we're so used to protesting and repelling and being so upset about the, the setup. Things are changing and we now need to contribute in, in um, and build and help and um, and that's what you're doing here. And that's what the whole cynical approach is really about. It's a chance, an opportunity for the first time ever to be constructive and to contribute. Yeah. So thank you. Yeah, I do believe that. And I believe whatever we believe helps, whether it's prayer through Lent or coming together like this or what, whatever it is, study. I mean, study is a form of prayer. <laughs> Simone Vale writes beautifully about that. So Fides, you doing your research in New York, I mean, whatever we're doing, it can be prayer. Um, and that is attentiveness and hope to, to see that. So I just want to say, i am just got to keep an eye on the time. We've got only a few minutes. Does anybody, and I was going to just show you a very short video I made, which shows you the history of Catholic Women Speak. But I want to just allow time in case anybody would like to come in. It's been all me talking tonight, but there will, future Zoom sessions will be more... Um, discussions not lectures because i will hope that people watch the lectures if they're interested beforehand tina i would like just to comment about um, what you have mentioned about hope um, it's very refreshing especially in the philippines right now we will be having the election and um we have one um a woman who will be you know running for president and even the catholic church in the philippines have been um, running and um, trying to, you know, um, really push that she will be um, voted by the by the, the people um, against uh, to uh, you know very abusive um, men who mm. are was in the politics. Um, I, I find your reflections, the things that you have mentioned, refreshing because really it keeps us hoping that. Whatever is happening right now, there will continue be to be hope 
and um, we just need to support each other and be able to voice out our own own voices yeah and I think the greatest enemy that we need to resist, because we all have it in us, is cynicism. I think cynicism is the enemy of faith, really. Um, so I do, yeah, I think we have we have an opportunity now. And there's an enormous energy around the world. I've never known anything like this. A time of such darkness, but such vitality. So, uh, Soko, I'm aware that you've joined us. Are you able to hear us? I'm not sure that, I'm not sure where Soko's joining us from. Anyone else want to, um, I mean, it may be that if there's an appetite for it, that we just make these Zoom sessions open rather than having them confined to the registration page so that we have a weekly discussion forum. I have your email addresses, I think. So I will, yeah, I'll have a think about how best to organize these going forward. But if you'd like to join in a weekly discussion and dialogue without necessarily signing up for the whole course, I think we can arrange that by putting the Zoom on the website. Tina, can I just say, um, yes. cynical as far as the bishops are concerned, as to what yeah. forward to Rome, but the fact that they said, the Vatican said, people are free to give their own or their own organisations feedback, I think is great. Plus the synod process, I'm already finding so invigorating groups like this and the Root and Branch Synod and, you know, Scottish Laity Network. And I've learned so much through the process that wherever we go, it's got a positive effect. I think that's right. I think that's right. Um, and in the end, well, personally, I believe the Catholic Church is what it says it is. I could not stay in it if I didn't believe that, because why would we stay in this crazy institution if it was only an institution? So, and if, you know, believing that, I, I believe it's it's redeeming and being redeemed. Um, painful though that process might be and stumbling through history, but so I have, I would like to finish, if you're okay with this, with a little video I put together of every image in this is something that's happened in Catholic Women Speak over the past seven years. And most of the images have come from our two trips to Rome when we had a very merry time and um, some workshops I've done with Catholic schools, with girls from Catholic schools, from Wimbledon High School, that I've done a lot of work with them. So all the images you're about to see are taken at Catholic Women Speak events. And I think they just end on a high note, which give you some sense of what we're about. So I'm just gonna share a different screen now again, this one. And if you need to go off, I'm aware that, it's now half past seven, so don't worry if you need to go off. Um, that's fine. So if I go to the home, and I hope you can hear this. Tell me if you can't. Don't you see use that? Oh, no, go away. In a <laughs> can you see that? If you're responsible yes. for driving new sounds, I hear it. You yep. own. seen a real rainbow I still believe though gotta believe though it hurts me when people are fighting different street sides words cut like sharp knives but it doesn't have to be that way I will not believe that I'm the only one who has that dream no, it doesn't have to be that way What will it take to make You believe the change is coming I know, I know the change is coming It's coming I know, I know the change is
saying we have to step back If someone is causing too many problems We need to stand for the truth now And I have no doubt That the path is lit for those who say That it doesn't have to be that way I will not believe That I'm the only one who has that dream No, it doesn't have to be that way What will it take to make You believe the change is coming Okay. Knitting isn't what you do. Oops. It's part of who you are. <laughs> At Craftsy, we understand that handmade means... So, <laughs> so, as you can see, we wear red shoes a lot. <laughs> we drink a lot of Prosecco. <laughs> and um, we've had some good times, but really rich gatherings of so many people across so many cultures. So it's lovely to have you here. And I shall keep an eye on the website because I'll put things there. I'll put things on Facebook and Twitter and feel free to share things if you have friends who would like to take part, but may not access all these different sources. And keep an eye out for us launching our questionnaire next Tuesday and spread the word as far as you can, because we really do want to get, you know, lots of um, responses. <laughs> It's wonderful, Tina. Thank you. And by the way, congratulations. You made it in the, the tablets list of uh, uh, 50 women lost to the church, 50 <laughs> women leaders lost to the church. Yes, I saw that because Brendan sent me the PDF and I thought, I haven't got anything in this week's tablet. Why has he sent it to me? And then I saw that. I thought, oh, dear God, the last thing I ever want to be is a leader in the I church. Know. Well, <laughs> you are. Well, you're and richly deserved and, and well done. Um, thank you. But it's, it's great. Yeah. Well, well, it's great to see you all here. And thank you for your support and solidarity. And same time, same place next week. Well, different places, same time. <laughs> and I'll post things in the meantime. I wish you all a really good week. And I know that we all hold deep in our hearts the people of Ukraine, the Philippines, everywhere where all of us, we, who are struggling towards the future in hope. All right. <laughs> and Ginny, you didn't get interrupted. <laughs> yeah, as you just said that, someone has walked in, but it's grown up, so they're not going to put their head in the in the camera. <laughs> right. Sorry, we've gone on a bit later tonight, but we will aim Thank to you. start and finish on time. All right. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye. And this has been recorded, so it will be out there. Okay. okay. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Bye. Bye.